Hello, everyone. My name is Sergei Maschenko. I'm from Sharknet Compute Canada and Compute Ontario. I'm based at McMaster University. I'm high performance computing consultant. Today, I will tell you how to profile your code on our cluster gram. Things you will learn today are also applicable to some extent to other clusters. So here's the plan. I will uh, walk you through a few slides, but the idea is to spend most of the time uh, doing live uh, demonstration of the profiling tools we have in Sharknet, specifically installed on Graham cluster. So we will have an introduction. I will describe some simple means to do profiling of your code, but most of the time we'll be spent discussing advanced profiling using our commercial tool map, which is great for profiling serial, MPI and OpenMP codes. Unfortunately, as I will detail later, it does not work with GPU profiling. And for that, I will describe another tool from NVIDIA. At the end, there should be time for questions. And let's start with the introduction. So in some sense, profiling can be defined as just timing your code. In a simple possible way, could be timing your whole code execution, whole clock time from start till end. And there are some simple tools to do that. And uh, profiling is used as part of iterative process of improving efficiency of your code in the sense that runtime gets smaller. So you want whole clock time to be as short as possible to get your results as soon as possible. Doing global timings or timing some large or specific sections of the codes can be achieved through simple means. And I will discuss that uh, part in a few next slides. But for serious profiling work, you want to use some dedicated tool like MAP, and we will discuss that later. So let's first cover simple profiling. Uh, you must all be have some familiarity with Linux because you are Sharpnet users, and you're probably aware of a uh, time command, which is, in fact, it's just built-in uh, command in a bash uh, shell. And the way to use it, you just say time, you type time, space, and then pass to your code. It can also be used with MPI codes, and uh, you prepend time before the MPI run command. And that's obviously should be done on an interactive node. And I'll discuss that in a few seconds. And uh, unlike debugging, which can be done in principle, even on a login node, which can be quite busy, when you do profiling, you want to have an empty node to get as accurate measurements as possible. And to reserve a compute node for profiling, the whole node, one can use or should use as our command, as described here. Uh, there is a switch dash C32, so I'm requesting 32 CPU cores for multi-threaded code execution. I will describe a trick. If you want this command to give you a node for both multi-threaded and MPI code execution and profiling, uh, there is a trick for that. So you allocate with dash C32, but if you want to run it as an MPI code, you have to provide special switch to your MPI run command. I'll show you uh, in a few slides. Uh, S hour gives you access to interactive node to uh, for up to three hours. This is a time limit, and that's how much I'm requesting in this command. Then you add your usual account information, which is either your supervisor's or your personal account, if you are the supervisor. And you're requesting pretty much the whole memory on the node. And the reason one wants to allocate the whole node, even if you are profiling just the serial code, uh, because there is a uh, quite likely possibility that sharing your uh, CPU cores, CPUs or rather, and node with other users will affect the accuracy of your profiling measurements. So for debugging purposes, you don't need to do that. When you do profiling, it's usually a good idea to allocate the whole node. If you only want to uh, profile MPI or serial code, you can use dash N32. But if you want to do both, as I just mentioned, it's better to allocate with dash C32 and then use a trick with your MPI run command. There is a caveat. Uh, CPU cores on Graham cluster, as 
pretty much all modern CPUs. They have a default state, which is much slower, idle state. For our Gram CPU course, it's 1,200 megahertz. And it takes non-negligible time to spin up once you run your code, apply a load to the core or to the course. It takes non-negligible time to spin up to the full speed, which is 2,600 megahertz. And this will affect accuracy of your profiling measurements, especially if you're measuring a fairly short time, let's say five, 10 seconds, something like that. To avoid this issue, the best way to profile short codes is to run them in a uh, fast succession in a loop. The simplest case, the loop can be organized using a bash uh, terminal tools. So here's a bash loop, which will execute 10 times this expression, which looks slightly complicated, just paste and copy. You need to do special tricks to, uh, to use time command inside bash loop, but uh, use it as described here. And there is a special redirect and you are grabbing the real keyword. Basically, time command returns a few values, and you want the real time. That corresponds to the wall clock time. That's what you want to measure. As written, this command will execute code, so replace with the path to your code, 10 times, and timings will be sorted, and uh, the shortest will be shown at the bottom. So you probably want to use the shortest as the most accurate measurement of the timing. This is not ideal because the bash-based loop will not really keep your CPUs busy. There will, there will be gaps, non-negligible. So the better way to do timings is to place timers inside your code. Unfortunately, that means you would have to recompile your code. Again, with this idea that going from idle to fully uh, spun up state takes time, so you want to do that in an internal loop inside your code to get the best possible accuracy. So uh, switching this to this slightly more advanced way to do timings, uh, placing timers inside your code. Uh, I will mostly concentrate in, on C, C++, but Fortran has something very similar tools. So for C, C++ codes, there, is, there are a few different ways to time the code inside the code. And one of them is to use function get time of day which has a decent accuracy, around 10 microseconds. And this snippet of the code shows how to use it. Uh, that's the include command you have to use. And then you place the ti first timing before the segment of the code you're about to time. And at the end, you place second timer. Unfortunately, this command uses slightly complicated way to store the data. It uses a structure, time well structure, and that's why you need one extra function. Uh, just Google for time val underscore subtract. This function is described in GNU documentation. Just paste and copy, use it in your code. And what it does, it takes those two structures and computes the actual difference of the time between these two timers in seconds. And then you can print it. If you time in uh, OpenMP code, things are simpler. OpenMP provides standard function, OMP underscore get underscore W time. Of course, you have to use include OMP.h because this is OpenMP code. And it returns convenient timing information as seconds from some arbitrary point in the past with double precision. So you do this uh, timing before the part of the code you're timing after, and then you just subtract the two, get high accuracy uh, timing information for this part of the code in seconds. And here's a, uh, a tip. You can use this trick also for serial non-OpenMP code. Uh, modern compilers, they all support, they have built-in OpenMP support. You don't need any external libraries. So take your serial code, add include OMP.h at the top, and compile it with dash Q OpenMP if it's Intel default compiler on Gram, or dash F OpenMP, which is a GCC switch. And then use those OMP get double the time anyway inside your code to get those measurements. So your code doesn't need to be multi-threaded to use these convenient routines. MPI uh, has a similar mechanism, convenient mechanism. You use a very similar to what I just showed in the previous slide. You use function MPI underscore W time before and after. And the difference gives you high accuracy, double precision, 
timing in seconds between uh, these two timing measurements. Uh, CUDA is slightly trickier. CUDA is GPGPU. Uh, if you want to measure accurately performance of your single kernel, the best way to do that is to use events, CUDA events. These are special routines which run on GPU and that uh, provides very high accuracy. It looks slightly complicated, but it, in fact, it's not nothing complicated. So what you need to do, you have to create two events, at least two, using CUDA event create. For example, start and stop, they have special type CUDA event underscore T. And then right before the kernel you are com profiling, you have to record one event. After the kernel, you record second event. And pay attention, there is no need to insert any synchronization, despite the fact that CPU code is asynchronous, or other kernels are asynchronous relative to the host code. That's all taken care of automatically. And uh, then there is a special function, could event elapse time. So you provide those two events, and it returns time difference, which is very accurate for a specific kernel. If you're profiling a complicated CUDA code, which contains potentially of multiple kernels running concurrently in streams, uh, plus the host code, which runs concurrently, asynchronously, uh, the only way to measure the whole thing is using uh, CPU-based timers, like get time of the day, or just uh, pretend it's an OpenMP code, compile it as OpenMP, and you can use OMP underscore get underscore W time and then you will measure the whole system performance. Now we're switching from those simplistic tools to much more sophisticated profiling using a tool called MAP, which is great for serial MPI and OpenMP codes profiling. MAP, uh, it's a commercial package. It's bundled up with another great tool, Parallel Debugger DDT, in a package called Forge. Uh, the original company which developed MAP and also DDT was Alinea, based in UK. In 2016, was acquired by the CPU ma maker ARM. So now we call it ARM, ARM's MAP. Sharknet has been using Alinea ARM products since 2006. So it's quite a long history for us. Uh, originally, only DDT was the useful thing we basically were paying for. Uh, the package came with a free utility OPT, which was parallel profiler, but it had terrible performance. Basically, it was useless. Uh, the main issue was it tried to store every single MPI communication of your code in a single file in the database, and it wasn't a good idea at all. Uh, one can easily have billions of MPI communication of a large parallel code running, let's say, over one hour. And it would be pretty much unmanageable to analyze those results, huge database. Uh, and also, it would take so much time to store the data that it would severely affect the accuracy of profiling. And then in 2013, Alinea came up with a much better product, fully useful for HPC code profiling, it's called MAP. The difference, significant difference, which made it successful, that now we are measuring not, uh, we're not recording every single communication. We, each rank has a certain interval, let's say 50 milliseconds, over which it just adds up all the time spent for MPI, send, receive, CPU, integer compute, and so on and so forth. And only those, that information is stored in the database. So Profiling becomes basically a statistical measurement. Each 50 millisecond, each rank stores average uh, properties, so what's going on at that particular time. Uh, one would think it maybe affects the accuracy of profiling, but in real terms, for codes which run long enough, let's say at least 30 seconds, this statistical approach is both manageable and highly accurate, so it became a success. Uh, more specifically, on cluster gram, profiler map can be accessed by loading module DDT-CPU, or you can use aliases, alinea-CPU or arm-forge-CPU. We have a very large license of, I suspect, almost never saturated. It is uh, for up to 512 CPU cores used by all 
gram users at any given time just for the map. We have similarly sized uh, license for DDT. So these are two separate licenses. I should also mention Niagara Cluster. It's another national system operated by Synet, has a smaller license for these products, up to 128 CPU cores. As far as I know uh, now, maybe it will change in the future, but right now Cluster Cedar doesn't have either MAP nor DDT. So Gram is basically your best choice if you want to do profiling or debugging of parallel codes, but also serial codes, it's very convenient. And even more specifically, how to use MAP on Gram Cluster. MAP and also DDT are GUI applications. The most, I would say, simplest way to run GUI application on Gram Cluster is by enabling X11 forwarding for the SSH connection you do to the cluster. At the very least, you want to add a dash capital Y to your SSH command when you log into the cluster. If you're a Windows user, you have to do one more step. You have to install a free software MobXterm. There are some other ways to achieve this, but MobXterm is by far the easiest way, which comes both with SSH terminal. That's why you type this command and provide dash capital Y. But it also comes bundled up with X Windows Server. This is software you need to enable X11 forwarding. And it's enabled by default. So all you do, install Mabux term, go to the terminal and type this command, replacing, of course, your login name and maybe cluster name. And then it should work. And the way it works, if you type a name of the GUI application, like X term, for example, you can do, use it for quick testing. A separate window should pop up on your Windows computer. Then that shows that everything works correctly. If you're a Mac user, you already have terminal which supports SSH, but you still need to install one extra free software, which is XQuartz. That's the X Windows Server. And then you type the usual uh, SSH dash capital Y command in the terminal. If you're a Linux user, then everything you need is already installed, not just uh, use this SSH command as shown here. If you're behind, uh, if you're using slow internet, let's say Wi-Fi internet, you might find this approach somewhat slow or inconvenient. Then you should consider using an uh, alternative uh, way to uh, run GUI application on Gram through VNC connection. This is more involved. Basically, every time you run it, you have to do some extra steps. I don't have time describing it, but if you run into uh, issues using X11 forwarding approach, please uh, Google for VNC Compute Canada to see full details how to set this up. So it provides better performance, but it takes longer to set up every time you use it. Uh, from now on, I will concentrate on X11 forwarding method. So once you log into Gram using dash capital Y switch, then you want to allocate the compute node for profiling and don't forget to add dash, dash X11 switch for your SLR command. This is equivalent to providing dash capital Y for SSH command. This is needed to enable X11 forwarding. It can be quite frustrating. For example, you did not plan to use your SLOC session to do uh, map profiling or DDT debugging. So you forgot, you did not include dash dash X11. And then you realize you want to use it, but you can't. You have to exit and then you ask for it again. It, you may lose a few hours. So. I would suggest you use dash dash X11 every time you use S alloc because just in case you might realize you need it. Once you allocate the full node as shown here using dash dash X11, then you should load the module DDT dash CPU dash, uh, sorry, slash 7.1. It is actually a newer version installed. Uh, it looks much newer, 18, version 18, but in fact, it is, it is just slightly newer. They change numbering uh, method they're using. So 7.1 is just slightly older and that's the most stable version. I advise to use that for now. Apparently we're having some issues with map under newer version. And uh, the only thing you need to do to your code you're about to profile, you have to add dash G. Unlike debugging, do not remove the standard optimization flags in your code. So if it has dash capital O2 or three, it has fast math or any switches like that, you have to keep them in place because that's, you want to profile the 
optimized version of your code. And to use map is as simple as typing map space path to your code. Even if it's MPI code, you do not need to say MPI run, just provide path to your code and map has MPI run built in. So that will be taken care of at the launch stage. If there are optional code arguments, you can include them here. Uh, a few caveats. Well, yeah, as I mentioned, 7.1 is seems to be the best version to use for now, but there is another caveat as well. There seems to be some uh, uh, not perfect situation between map and the scheduler slurm. This results in one CPU core being fully used at 100% when you run map inside your S alloc session. That means you have to allocate one more CPU core just for that purpose. So if you, let's say, profile serial code, you have to allocate at least two CPU cores. But as I described earlier, ideally you want to allocate the whole node. If you need to profile 16 CPU cores MPI code, you need to have at least 17 CPU cores available. Just allocate one more CPU core for that hidden system process. And uh, there is another trick if uh, you need to profile longer than three hours, longer than S alloc maximum runtime, which is, by the way, not a very good idea. Ideally, you want to profile something fairly short, maybe 20 minutes, half an hour max, but let's say you need that feature. Or let's say you need to profile something which requires so much resource, so many CPU cores or memory, something which is not accessible via S alloc, so you need to submit a regular job to the scheduler. It is possible, and so what you need to do, you have to add those lines in your job script. First, you have to load the module, and then you have to run it with map with this extra switch dash dash profile. If it's an MPI code, uh, which uh, requires 16 CPU cores, you also say dash n16 and then pass to your code. Uh, this way, map will not launch any GUI, any Windows, and it will record all the information in a special file which has map extension. And by the way, even if you run map interactively, you still create that file, which is very convenient. Uh, you can run your map command anytime offline and the argument being the map file you generated either interactively or through a job. And it will open up all this detailed profile information which you can analyze offline. So it's very convenient, generally speaking, but specifically if your profiling job runs longer than three hours or requires lots of CPU cores or memory and you have to run this as a job through the scheduler. So I have a few slides which show the screenshots, but I'd rather use a live demonstration to show these features. So I'm switching to my terminal. So now everyone should be able to see my terminal. I already logged into the cluster gram, and I also ran the s alloc command. So I'm already inside the compute node. As you can see, it's a gram 796, and I can now run my code interactively. I'm going inside my profiling subdirectory. By the way, after the webinar, if you want to copy some of my examples, they are accessible here in my uh, SYM. This is my login name slash profiling directory. So no, please don't do it now, but you can copy the examples after the webinar. So we are inside this directory. There are a few examples I'll be showing today. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to load the ddt-cpu slash 7.1. By the way, as name suggests, we have also another flavor, dash GPU. Unfortunately, it does not support map profiling, only CUDA code debugging, so I will not be showing it today. So it's loaded correctly, it didn't complain. Uh, I'm going to show you some simple example. So I have a serial code, I compile with dash, with I ICC, the default compiler, dash, so I'm compiling it optimized, but I also have to add dash G. And the example I'm going to show is good cache use dot C. Okay, it's compiled. It produced the binary file, which we can run interactively. 
But in this case, I want to profile it. So I'm going to say map space pass to my code binary. And you will see a sequence of a few windows. So first you see the intro, the first window, which where you set up parameters before you run your code. Normally it auto detects if it's MPI or OpenMP or CUDA. In this case, it's just serial code. There is nothing special here. So what I do, I just gonna click run. This is a short code. It only runs for, I believe, eight seconds. You can, if it runs much longer than you expect, you can always stop and analyze. So you can stop at any time you want, but you want to run it for at least 10 seconds or so to accumulate enough of statistical information. So it does some processing, and now you see the default map window, which is already useful for many uh, profiling tasks. Uh, I'll just emphasize a few useful features. So this is the default preset. There are multiple things you can see as a time function. So actually, times goes on. You see those histograms, and they also use different color to see what's going on. Uh, also, it will show part of your code. That's why you needed this dash G line in your compiling uh, command, so you actually see code lines. And this is the beautiful feature. It will emphasize the most CPU intensive, uh, or the most time consuming, rather, line of your code. In this case, it's properly written, uh, optimized code, so most of my time, 99.7%, are spent in a CPU intensive function, which I'm generating at random numbers here. So they're not spent or wasted elsewhere. So this is uh, an indication of uh, well-written code. Uh, some more details are available below. You see a list of different lines and with more specific timings. And you can click on those lines. Some of them have no debug info because this is system function but things which part, are part of your code will be listed here with very detailed time uh, evolution or uh, basically a time profile of your code. Uh, you can also zoom in in particular parts of your code. He, this is the time. Uh, you can see timings listed here. You can zoom in in a part of your code. You highlight and uh, it recomputes information for that specific segment of your code. So you can see it's now more detailed. Uh, and in fact, it's 100% efficient in your code and numbers change here. You should remember the time uh, step is around 50 milliseconds, so you should not zoom in too much. Otherwise, everything will become just very inaccurate, so you won't be able to see much. And uh, it also provides often a useful tips and hints on the right panel that you will see some uh, something in red, probably something which needs your attention. Green is usually good. Uh, and I also should tell you here that besides the default set of uh, metrics you can see, there are multiple presets. Uh, for example, if you are profiling MPI code, maybe you want to choose preset MPI. And as I will show later in specific examples, uh, uh, you will appreciate these different presets. Uh, this is pretty much all I wanted to say, just describe it describing the basic interface of MAP. Let me discuss more specifically the example we are looking at. So this is a simple example of serial code profiling. And there is a fairly, I'm not sure if it's common, but fairly serious profiling mistake a beginner programmer could do. Uh, this relates to efficiency of cache utilization. So all CPU cores have cache to accelerate accesses to the memory, and that helps a lot uh, to speed up your code uh, if you use it correctly. If you use a C, C++ code, the correct way to re do reads and writes to the memory is in a so-called row major order. Basically, if you have loops, you want to make sure you're accessing your structure, arrays, vectors, in a way that next iteration reads next element in memory, physically next. And for C++, that means if you use multidimensional array, the very last index should be corresponding to the innermost loop. In other words, it should be ch changing the fastest. 
If you make mistake, do the opposite, then you will not be reading consecutive values from your memory. You'll be using a large stride, jumps across the memory, and that really nullifies uh, advantage of caching, and your performance can be much, much worse. So let me demonstrate that in live code. So what you're looking at, actually a good, uh, proper way to use cache. It is a row major way. So you see double loop here, and you see the rightmost index corresponds to the innermost loop. By the way, if you use Fortran code, it's exactly the opposite. Your very leftmost index should be the fastest change. But C, C++, it should be the rightmost. And as you can see here, there are no issues identified. You spend 100% time where you're supposed to be spending doing these CPU intensive stuff, generating random numbers. So what happens? How map can help you to identify if you did wrong way? So let me compile a bad cache use program. So the hope is that map will make it very obvious that you did something wrong and sort of suggest how to fix it. So I'm gonna do the same thing I did before. So this code actually will run longer, I believe. Let's see. Probably longer than eight seconds because it is much less efficient. As I explained before, if it takes too long, you can always stop and analyze, but I think it should be around, around 30 seconds or so. If not, okay, so. So that alone tells you that must be very inefficient. It took much longer to run this code, factor of four. And as we will see in a second, that's solely due to incorrect uh, uh, utilization of caching. So where are the red flags here? In fact, indeed, memory access is red flag. You spend 72%, it's a huge number in a code which is supposed to be CPU bound. It's supposed to spend all its time in uh, CPU utilization. It is not memory bound code, but instead, and also another utilization uh, indication is here. If you remember before, it used to have 100% spend on this line, which is perfect. Now we see there is a 40 or 32% time spent elsewhere. And also indication is here that's, uh, you know, Here's the 32% uh, line, which is supposed to be 0%. I mean, it's not telling exactly you are using incorrect, uh, instead of row major, using call major approach. And here's the mistake. You just have to figure it out. It gives you enough of information. You're doing memory access incorrectly. It tells you where, which loop it's happening incorrectly. And then you have to use your extra knowledge to figure out, okay, so this is C code but my fastest innermost loop index is leftmost, where in fact has to be rightmost. So we're using large stride memory access, which is really bad, and as you just seen, results in factor of four longer performance of your code, which is terrible. Just one simple mistake and a very simple fix. All you need to do is either to swap the indexes in your array or swap the loops ordering. Whatever is works for your particular code should be done, and that then you will see the best possible cache and performance. So that was a simple example for serial code profiling. What about NPI codes? I have a simple, well, relatively simple example of so-called dynamic workload balancing exercise. This is technique which is frequently employed by NPI codes when you're not, you, you don't know at compile time how much workload each MPI RAM can get. So what you do, you arrange a dynamic workload balancing scheme where basically there is a master rank which slices up the whole workload you need to do into fairly small chunks of workload. And every time a worker, MPI rank which needs to do worker stuff, approaches master and asks for next uh, chunk of the workload and is being served. And because it's done runtime, you achieve a dynamic workload balance. It works well as long as your chunk size is correctly chosen. And well-written code should have a way to adjust the size of the chunk. As you will see, because 
you need to fine tune that parameter to achieve the best possible performance. So it's part of your profiling exercise to find out which chunk size is the best one for your code. And this is the example code, uh, which I'm not sharing. Unfortunately, I can't, it's part of my teaching assignment. But um, what I'm doing inside, using some nano sleep fake workload inside each rank to imitate real workload. And here I'm listing actual timings on Gram cluster. If I say I have one chunk per CPU core per rank, Obviously, I cannot do workload balancing at all. So each rank gets one chunk and that's it. So I kill my workload balancing approach. And that's why my, I can get severe workload imbalance, as you can see from these timings. Timings are very large, almost 30 seconds. Uh, when I go to reasonable size of chunks, between 10 and 1,000 of chunks per rank, I get a decent performance, around 16 seconds. But if you push too far, let's say 200,000 chunks per CPU core, I'm running into another profiling issue. My MPI communications become so short and small that I'm becoming latency bound. So I'm basically, I'm wasting too much time on the latency of my MPI communications. So my efficiency drops. So there is a best golden middle value of chunk size, which you can that uh, just doing global timings, or you can map profiler. You can use map profiler to get those measurements for you. So I will show this as a, uh, my next demonstration. So I have MPI code, which I will compile using MPI CC dash G dash standard optimization. And I'm gonna compile this code. Uh, I'll have to look up what exactly chunk size I'm using in this particular exercise. So my chunk size is one. So this is not per core, it's just the size of my chunk, which might be slightly confusing, but basically this is the worst case in terms of latency. So this case should be latency bound. My chunk size is extremely small, so I should be latency bound. So I, I'm going to use map with this code. As I explained, for MPI codes, you don't need to provide MPI run. It will be used automatically. And here's the trick I was going to show you. If you allocate your node with dash C32, you cannot just simply run MPI run, either interactively or inside map you have to provide extra switch for your MPI run command or put it inside your map launch window. And the S, this extra switch is dash dash oversubscribe. If you don't do that, you'll get an error, not enough slots available. But once you do that, you can run MPI commands inside SALOC session allocated with dash C32, which is normally used for multi-threaded code. Then use number of processes, let's say 16. And don't forget that another caveat. So you have to use one CPU core fewer than the number of cores you allocated because you need to pro uh, leave one CPU core for system purposes. So I uh, allocated 32 CPU cores, so I'm, it's perfectly fine to use 16 MPI ranks. And the rest, it looks good. It auto detected this is MPI code, and now I can run it. There is one extra step. It dynamically compiles a special library for your code. It does it every time you run your code. And there is an issue with the newer version of map. It times out at this step. That's why I recommend for now to use the version 7.1, which seems to be running without issues. Now we can see there are 16 CPU cores you connected to. Now it will run the code. It actually runtime was probably too short. I had a, should have changed the parameter. So latency effect might not be as obvious, but let's hope it will show up. So it does the usual thing. And 
as I explained, it is a little bit too short, actually it's only 3.3 seconds, so that's why the time resolution is not great. But let's hope it does show up. So what we see here, the actual CPU intensive part is indeed being used at 92%, which is pretty decent. And then you get some MPI stuff, which is being used at around 60% or rather wasted at 6% level. So I suspect if I run longer job, it would be more obvious. It would be larger number here. Uh, you can switch to metrics like MPI preset. Then you get many, many more things if you're really into details. MPI call duration uh, as time, uh, as a function of time, received MPI calls and so on. But for our purposes, we don't even need that metric. We can just go back to the default. And basically what you see here, you probably spend too much on MPI receive. And that's one of the effects of the latency dominate. Unfortunately, there is no red flag telling, oh, you're latency dominate. Basically, all of a sudden you see you spend way too much time on MPI send, receive, and so on. So this is the side effect of being latency dominated. And let me show you when you are basically, so chunk size, total number of elements is 30,000. Let's say I'm gonna use 10 CPU cores. So to be, to have poor workload balancing, I have to have, let me see, uh, 30,000 divided by 10, it's like 3,000, if I get my math correctly. I think 3,000 is really bad, it's too large chunk size. So we have 3,000, there are 30,000 total, so there'll be basically uh, 10 chunks total, you divide this by this, and if you have 10 CPU cores, there is no opportunity for dynamic workload balancing. So let's try this. And maybe I wanna try it a little bit larger. Maybe instead of 30,000, I'm gonna make 100,000 because it's a little bit too short and I will fix. And I will use 10 CPU cores. I'm gonna recompile the same example. So now we will have a poor dynamic workload balancing case. So let's see how map can identify that. And that is actually more obvious than latency dominated regime as you will see in a second. So this will run a little bit longer because increase size and I want to use 10 CPU cores and the same oversubscribe. It will again dynamically generate a library which will take a few seconds All right, we're using 10 CPU cores. Now it will run the code. It will probably take 10 seconds or so, 15. We'll see. And you can already tell it's doing something not correctly because I have print statement for each rank and they're kind of slow instead of being all printed at the end. It's sort of an indication that workload balancing is not great, but map will give you much clearer picture. If you remember, before we had almost 100% on this line compute and then, uh, so the, the telltelling thing here is you're spending way too much time on MPI finalized, the very last MPI command. You're spending 40% of your total CPU cycle. This is way unacceptable. There's, this is a sure sign that uh, workload balancing is not working properly. Too many ranks arrive here early and just waste their time waiting here, sitting idle. So this is the sure sign that your workload balancing is not done correctly. And you, what you have to do, go back to change your chunk size, make it smaller. So each worker has at least a few chunks to work with to achieve good workload balance. So I'll, I probably don't have time to show the optimal result, so if you choose the chunk size optimal, then you will see pretty much 100% spent on computing and very little time spent on uh, some other stuff like MPI finalize or uh, MPI send and receive. All right, so that was the MPI example. Switching back to my slides. And very briefly, I'll walk you through opening MP profiling example. 
Uh, there are multiple ways you can get very inefficient OpenMP code. And here's one specific situation. Uh, there is such a thing as critical region in OpenMP code, which is strongly advised to be used sparingly because it's very expensive for multiple reasons. And one of the reasons it breaks parallelism because critical region protects uh, the code enclosed. Only one thread at a time can do that. And sometimes it's used inside a loop which you parallelize to do a reduction. C, C++ codes cannot do cannot use reduction clause to compute things like maximum or minimum. So you have to use something like critical region, even though there are better ways to do that. And this most straightforward and the worst way to do that is to place critical region inside your code. And inside you say, if x is larger than x max, then x max is equal x. Technically, it's correct. But what it means, each iteration, each thread will be going through this critical region, which is super expensive. As I will show in a few seconds, it dramatically uh, makes your code dramatically inefficient. So the proper, the trick to fix that is to add precondition before the critical region. So for first you do the precondition, the same condition as will be inside critical region. So you pre-select only those iterations of those threads which are good candidates to be to have the maximum value in this case. And those very rare occasions we enter the critical region and do the actual final analysis. And then we do protected operation. We update values of the reduction shared variable. So you need both the precondition to speed up your code and inside critical regions to make it correct 100% of the time. So what happens if you forget to put this pre-selection? And you will see in the following example. Uh, and by the way, here are the map files. Every time I run my map code uh, or command, it generates those map files. And now we can always go back and say map in one of the previous sessions, and it will not spend time rewriting your code. It's already there. You can reanalyze your code without rewriting your code, which is very convenient. But I'm going to the OMP critical example. Let me see if I have the bad or good case. So right now, I, I am using precondition. So there are two if statements. I'm going to comment it out. I want to show you how it looks like when you did not do that. And the performance should be extremely bad. In fact, it can be so bad that, OK, I can always press stop. If it runs too long, then I just press pause and analyze what I've done so far. So I'm going to use ICC-02-G-Q. OpenMP. I'm using Intel compiler. And I'm going to compile the bad performing code, OpenMP code. All right. Uh, we can use map. Again, just map and then pass to your binary. It should auto detect that this is an OpenMP program. And by default, well, we'll see how many threads. By default, we try to use one. But we're going to use, let's say, 30 threads. And then it auto detects it's OpenMP. And I'm running out of time. So we're going to accelerate the, uh, the final part of my presentation. And I suspect my parameters will result in a very long runtime. So I'll just wait maybe 20 seconds or so and analyze. You can always do that with map. OK, I'm going to do that. So let's see what it's, what's been happening so far. You don't have to worry. There is some warnings about sampling rates and so on, but it should not affect our session. OK. All right, let's see. This right away already tells me something is going on. You spend some inside the system level function, which has a critical inside. It's obviously related to critical region. So this is supposed to be CPU bound code. So you're supposed to spend all your time inside this line generating random numbers. You don't, it doesn't even show up on the radar here. It's effectively zero compared to all the time you spend inside critical region. So a critical region, which should be very low weight, in fact, occupies all your CPU cycle. 
So it's totally unacceptable. In fact, I did more accurate measurements. It's two orders of magnitude slower because of incorrect usage of critical region. So if you go back and modify our code and uncomment that, so we have both precondition for efficiency and final if statement inside, inside critical region for the accuracy. And we recompile the code. Now it will run dramatically, like two orders of magnitude faster uh, compared to the bad case. And I'm going to run my A out binary. And using the same settings. So this should run much faster. In fact, so much faster, it might not even have enough of sampling for accurate statistics. Yeah, only 41. You can increase size of your code. I just don't have time to do that. This should be already good enough to show the dramatic improvement. So we are now using critical region correctly, and that's what you see. Now with the CPU intensive part, the random number generation is in fact using most of your cycle. In fact, if I used a larger, longer code, it would use 90 plus percent of my CPU cycles. And critical region now kind of shows, but much, much lower extent. But uh, basically, take my word for that. It's two orders of magnitude improvement, and you can already see what exactly happening with very short example using MAP2. All right, and switching back, very, just a few words about CUDA profiling. Unfortunately, the license for MAP we have does not cover the CUDA profiling, even though technically is capable of doing line-by-line -line profiling for CUDA kernels. There is NVIDIA visual profiler called NVP, NVVP, which is part of NSIDE, so you can use either. NVVP just runs faster because it's, because it's standalone. NSIDE has it as bundle up too. And I don't have time to show how to run it. Uh, I'll just show the slides. So basically, allocate with extra dash dash GRS. So you want to allocate with the GPU. You still want to have dash dash X11 for your GUI support because NDVP is a GUI based application. And then you load module CUDA and NDVP is part of that module. You compile your code as usual. Nothing special needs to be done. And then you run your code with NDVP on the compute node with the GPU. It, this tool does not provide you line-by-line -line profiling information like MAP does. Instead, it provides very detailed information about each kernel, much more than a MAP would do. So in a sense, it's a compensation. So it can be quite useful. With NVVP, the way you use it, there are a few buttons. You click through them, compile with extra detailed information, things like that. And the good example, I don't have time to demonstrate, just show the slide. Uh, somewhat similar to CUDA example, my serial code, where incorrect pattern of reading from device memory in this case can result in very bad performance. So you really want your next thread, CUDA thread, to read the next location in device memory. That result in the best possible performance. If you do it the wrong way, run it through NDVP, and then you click through a couple of tests, and specifically you need to run perform additional analysis. Uh, what you will see uh, here, this is the red flag. Global store efficiency is only 12%, which means you're writing to the device memory extremely inefficient. And that happens because you're using wrong stride. So next thread is not writing to the next location memory. It writes much further down. It's a large stride. It's a poor pattern, non coalesce if you fix your code and make sure your next thread reads or writes to the next physical location device memory, what you will see here is 100% store or load efficiency. So uh, NVVP can be quite useful to detect problems of this kind. So I'm going to finish now. Thank you very much for your attention.